welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Rate and review the show at kevinmd.com slash rate. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash follow. Today in the show, we have Lara Patrick Wynn. She's a radiologist, physician coach, and speaker. Her Kevin MD article is titled, Using Inquiry-Based Stress Reduction to Treat Medical Malpractice Stress Syndrome. Lara, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Kevin. We'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. Thank you, Kevin. Well, I don't know if you're anything like this, but when I was in training, I really bought into the notion of delayed gratification, that once I had finished training and once I was financially independent and got married and had children, then instantly and miraculously, my life would get better and I would be happy. And that dream kind of helped me get through all of the stress associated with the, 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 the training time that we have. But then I was quite disappointed to notice that after all of that training and with all the responsibilities of being a physician, all the responsibility of being a mother, being a wife, I was actually much more stressed out mm -hmm. after training than I was before and certainly much less happy than I was after training than before I'd started medical school. And it came to a bit of a crunch and I just said, you know, what gives? And part of me wanted to drop everything and go to India and find myself and do all that. But I had too many responsibilities. I had too much going on. And so I really looked hard at the scientific notions of how the mind works, the scientific underpinnings of well-being, looked at the more Eastern philosophies about that, the Western psychological viewpoint about that, to really say, well, what can I do? I have worked so hard for this training. I worked so hard to become a physician for this life. And the status quo just wasn't working, you know, just too unhappy, too stressed out. And so it got me really looking to the underpinnings of how the mind works. Why is it that the mind gives us such a stressful impression of life? And what can I do to help that? And so the first thing I started doing was meditation. And meditation, I only picked up, you know, this is nothing that I, I had grown up with. And in fact, I had a little bit of an aversion to, mm -hmm. but there was these studies done in the early 2000s where they had brought initially Tibetan monks and they imaged their brains under MRI at the University of Wisconsin. And to me, that was such a sign because what they were showing was that the underlying neuroplastic process that we have naturally in our, in our minds was actually working to change the structure and function of our brains from the process of meditation. So the imaging had just caught up to be able to detect those subtle differences. And we were seeing those subtle differences in people who were practicing the piano, people who were studying and practicing different things, we could start to see the, the brain differences, kind of like the muscle, you know? So this report, these reports came out, you know, really the early 2000s. And, and part of me, as a radiologist, as a stressed out radiologist, could not ignore this. And so I started a meditation practice of my own and found it so helpful, you know, just to take the edge off all of the stress, all these stressful thoughts that I was having, that my enthusiasm got the better of me. And, and I then got a position teaching meditation at Kirtland Air Force Base here in, in Albuquerque, teaching airmen pre and post deployment to Iraq and Afghanistan how to meditate, process of mindfulness, giving them some understanding of how their minds work, how PTSD happens, to be able to assist them somewhat with this incredible stressful events, you know, of the war, you know, just stress beyond anything that, equivalent anyways to anything that we can imagine in the medical career. And what that really taught me was that we are all running the same hardware. You know, if I look MRI or your MRI of my brain or the MRI of an airman or of a prisoner or of a convict, they all look the same. We're running the same, the same mental processes and we've got the same hardware and we have this very primitive parts of our brain and we have these incredibly sophisticated parts of our brain. And it's really the interface between all those parts of our brains that lead us to a lot of stress. And until we really understand that that's the bugaboo on how we're generating our thoughts, we get caught up buying into everything we think. We get mm -hmm. trying to fix everything on the outside so that inside we feel okay. And as we know in medicine, as we know now with COVID, as we know with now with the markets and with wars, you can't, you can't control the outside events in your life. And I was getting tired trying to control the outside events in my life to make me happy. And so starting to understand the mind with that perspective really helped me out. 
and then starting to understand what practices helps, right? So the meditation was super helpful. But then I got into a process called inquiry, mm. based stress reduction. And I tell my clients, if meditation is like medicine, inquiry is like surgery. In the moment when we're super stressed out because something is happening and our thoughts just start to go crazy about events, and that could be, as I'm going to talk about later in the malpractice lawsuit environment, it could be in a relationship, it could be our chairman telling us something we don't like, it could be our kids rolling their eyes at us. The moment we get stressed, we are, we are stressed because we're believing thoughts that aren't true for us. In this, in this paradigm, this is how inquiry works. And what inquiry does is allows us, it gives us a very solid tool to see beyond all of these kind of crazy thoughts that we have, to be able to come to a place that our mind becomes tranquil again. Because as long as we're believing our stressful thoughts, our stressful thoughts are going to stay with us. And so inquiry is a kind of a way to really see beyond these stressful thoughts to a place that the thoughts can't stick anymore. And this was this tremendous technology that I thought was so, so effective for me and so effective for then all of my clients in the military, now in the business community and in medicine to kind of change your mind about something in a really pretty short amount of time. You know, I'm a little bit sometimes too impatient for this meditation mindfulness thing. Mm -hmm don't have multiple lifetimes to get enlightened. I need answers to my yeah. problem immediately because there's a lot happening. And so inquiry to me has just become this just tremendous technology to help me see beyond what feels like an insurmountable problem and actually turn it into an opportunity. Then you talk about that in your Kevin MD article, using inquiry-based stress reduction to treat medical malpractice stress syndrome. Now, for those who didn't get a chance to read your article, just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided to write it. Thank you. Yes. So my malpractice experience, now I've had two malpractice experience. One, I was sued. And the other was when I did expert witness work. And in both circumstances, I got incredibly stressed getting that envelope, finding out that someone had taken, gone through all the pains to sue me was incredibly distressing. And what happened to me when I had this stressful event is these reams and reams of thoughts come up that I couldn't let go of, right? These are the thoughts that keep you up at three o'clock in the morning. Thoughts such as they're going to take me for everything I've got. I'm going to lose the respect of my community. I'll never work again. They're going to take all my money. It's going to be a terrible experience. These thoughts just populate our minds and we can't let go of them. Even when I, you know, at this point, I'd already had a pretty significant meditation practice. I was pretty good at, you know, letting things mm -hmm. go. This was just became so sticky. And why it's sticky, the lawsuit in itself isn't the stressful event. It's our thoughts about the lawsuit that mm -hmm. are stressful, right? Like your lawsuit wouldn't be stressful to me because my thoughts are pro probably a great doctor. It happens, you know, in, in high-risk specialties, it's almost 100% sure that you are going to get sued, right? So... I wouldn't see that as a problem for you being sued, but you do because we hold these underlying thoughts to be true. One, I can't make a mistake. Two, I will lose the respect of my community. Without the respect of my community, I am nothing. Mm -hmm. All of the things that we've thought since we were children that were also super concretized during our medical training, right? Our medical training is an incredible thing, but has not helped our well being on multiple levels. And so, what inquiry allows us to do is to actually use the lawsuit as a jumping point for greater understanding of self, greater self-compassion, greater awareness, and greater wisdom, in that we can use all of these thoughts that we have, we put them down on paper, and we question them using this very formulaic, really wonderful, solid, programmatic way of looking at thinking, to see beyond them and to see, you know, is it really true, all of these things that I'm thinking about? Is it really true that I'm going to lose the respect of my community? Or actually, is it possible, flip it around, is it actually possible that, that this is actually going to help me in the community? Is, this gonna, is it possible that this is going to be the best? How is it possible that this may be the best thing that's ever happened to me, right? And so every challenge and every, you know, it's sort of ancient wisdom that any challenge we can go through can become the greatest opportunity that we have. Mm -hmm. but we can't do it unless we know and we, unless we have some kind of technology to convert it. 
And to me, the inquiry-based stress reduction is that technology that allows me to take what seems like a really big obstacle into an actual opportunity for self-growth and wisdom and compassion and potentially new, new possibilities that you have never even thought about. So walk us through that. You said that it's a fairly formulaic set of questions that a physician should ask himself or herself under periods of stress, especially under periods of malpractice related stress. So you talked about some of those questions earlier. Go into yes. a little bit more detail in terms of what some of that exact process will what entail. So let's look at a thought. So what would you think? I don't know if you've been sued before and we don't, what do you think would be the first thought would pop into your mind if I said to you, okay, we're suing you for care of Mrs. X. You know, you were obviously sloppy in your work. And because of that, your patient, this patient has a very, had a terrible outcome. What would your first thought come into your mind? I guess the first thought would be you would question whether you were a good physician. That's right. Right. So I'm not a good physician. Okay. We can start with that one. I'm not a good physician. So the first question I would ask you is, is that true? Okay. In that moment, it may be true that you're feeling it's a no. It could be a no and a no or a yes to that question is equal, but that's just where you're at. The second question is, can you absolutely know that it's true that you are not a good physician? Right? Can you, are you really in a position to understand that? Like, can you know that without a shadow of a doubt, right? So just open to the possibility. Is it possible that how I'm seeing this experience isn't the whole truth, you know? Because when we're stressed, we're a hundred percent sure, you know? Mm -hmm. The third question is, how do I react? What happens when I believe that thought? Okay, so who do you become when you hold the notion that you're not a good physician? Okay, so for me, that would be one, remembering every single mistake I've ever made in my whole mm -hmm. life. Going back to grade school, right? It would be seeing images of myself in the future, making more mistakes, getting more lawsuits. It would remind me of any negative feedback I've ever had. It would give me a sensation of constriction in my belly. It would make me feel like I'm kind of bottoming out and my energy level goes down. It would make me resent my job. It would make me resent everybody involved in that lawsuit. It might make me resent the patient who's suing me. On the other hand, it might make me think, well, maybe they're right, you know, mm. maybe it's really the truth, you know? And we start to see that we're actually holding very discrepant viewpoints about things, but we're holding them both and we think they're all true, you know? So that third question really allows us to say, well, what's the identity? What happens to me when I'm holding that? And once we've kind of exhausted that, and it's really important to exhaust that because if we don't go there. We don't actually see what really happens to me, you know? It's like an inventory. The fourth question is, who would I be without that thought? And this takes a little bit of imagination, right? So Kevin, you're given this envelope, but for some reason in your neurochemistry, you, you can't entertain the thought that you're not a good physician. So who are you when you open that envelope? Can you picture that event happening without holding, I am not a good physician, right? I don't know if you can imagine that. It's a tricky thing to imagine because it's mm -hmm. the first thing for us to go. But if I could imagine that, I couldn't think I'm not a terrible physician. I actually notice I've got compassion for this person suing me, potentially, you know? And that was, that was the case for me as I did all of this a number of years ago. There's compassion there. There's compassion for the legal system. There's compassion for the lawyer, you know? This is his job. This is what he does. He's thinking this. He's believing this. It's not personal, right? It's not mm -hmm. personal to me. I really get that they don't see me the way I see myself. That their, their image of the events that happened aren't the same as my image of what happened, right? One, one event happened, but we're looking at it from two very different perspectives. So I can acknowledge, I can hold that I'm okay and they're okay too. And that gives me the freedom in that situation, right? In that situation without the thought, and then people think, oh, well, if I don't think I'm shitty and I'm not hard on myself, I'm not going to defend myself. Hmm. That, we, physicians hold that so tightly. Everybody does. But physicians hold that particularly tightly. Unless I'm hard on myself, unless I give myself these really hard expectations, and if I don't meet them, if I'm tough, you know, I will fail, you know. And we come to find out it's actually the opposite is true. I can really say now that I'm 
successful, not because of my anxiety and not because of being so hard on myself, but despite it, right? Sure. So without the thought that I'm a terrible physician as this is happening, I'm in a place that I can defend myself. I'm in a place that I can show up in court likable. And it's really important to show up in court likable. It's actually one of the most important strategies for you going into court is to show up likable, which is hard if you're holding that I'm this shitty position, right? So then we, we investigate that and then we go into the opposites. So what would be an opposite to I'm a terrible physician? What would that be? Would be I'm a wonderful physician. I'm a wonderful physician, right? Yeah. Up the ways. Give me some examples, right? So I'll ask you, Kevin, what 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 are the ways in which you're a good physician? I listen to my patients. Listen to my patients. Yeah. I give my patients the time they need. Yep. Other other examples. I empathize with the situation. I'm compassionate to the situation that they come yeah. up with. Yeah. So these are all questions yeah. that I would think to myself. That's right. And you might think for me anyways, it was like, yeah, I've tried my darndest. I show up this, I, I come on time. It's important for me, all this stuff, you know, I think of potential awards that I may have won in the past. So it's really important then that we take a, give specific examples of why the opposite of what we're thinking is, isn't actually true. And in that, we start to build up this case again and get a closer look at reality. And what happens to my clients when they do that, they can see, yeah, you know what? I, I am a good physician, you know? I went to a good school, I work my hardest. And then also I see that other people that I consider really good physicians are also getting sued, you know? Everybody knows somebody who's getting sued, right? It's, it's so rampant, you know? If 96% of your colleagues, something's happening to them, are you going to say that they're all terrible physicians? We can't notice that until we've gone through this process. We can't really actually come back to that realization and see the situation from a higher perspective if we're caught up in that tight, tight place of I'm a terrible physician. So that, in a nutshell, is, is the work, right? The work started, it's an ancient process. It's really since Socrates that we've mm -hmm. been doing but this particular methodology is called the work of Byron Katie. And it's all of it is free on the work.com. And it's been very, very popular in the self-help arena. Her books have sold millions and millions of copies. There's all these followers that, that follow her, but more recently in the last 10 years or so, there's been some really well done research showing how this process can help in a multiple arenas, in, in particular in cancer patients, burnout in teachers, in, I think in the military as well, that this process can really help people live with less stress, you know, live with less, what stresses us out is the thoughts about these events, mm -hmm. right? And that really brings us down. And so we've seen that tremendously during COVID, all of the thoughts that we had about COVID, you know, it's not COVID itself that causes the stress, it's the thoughts that we have. And that's why we noticed that some people were fine and some people really, really suffered, you know? And so, in my opinion, inquiry can take you the whole way. Like this is something you can use with a, like with a, a fatal diagnosis. You know, this is something you can use when the most terrible situations, I've done it with people who've lost children, who've had a spouse to commit suicide, with stage four breast cancer diagnoses. There's nothing that this process can't help with in those places. and can bring you right to the mat, you know, right down to those really, really, really things that we would call tricky, but then you start to see, you know, maybe they're not, you know, and I'm sure you've, you've had patients that get a diagnosis and initially it seems like the worst thing in the world. And some of them, even before they die, think, you know, I'm grateful this happened to me. I'm grateful that I'm finishing my life in this way. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion then about inquiry-based stress reduction is really like a wisdom accelerator. How do I get that beautiful wisdom that some people have at the end of their lives now? How do I shorten the period of time it will take to get over this lawsuit? Because for some people, they go out of commission for two or three years. Mm. Once it's over, I'll be happy. You know? It's kind of like saying, once COVID's over, I'll be happy. Well, then there's wars and there's this. There's always going to be something. Always going to be something. So that's, that's inquiry-based stress reduction and such a wonderful and effective technology to help with our stress. We're talking to Lara Patrickwin. She is a radiologist, physician coach, and physician speaker. Her Kevin MD article is titled, Using Inquiry-Based Stress Reduction to Treat Medical Malpractice Stress Syndrome. 
Lara, what are some of your take home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? So one, to start to think about stress as believing in a thought that's not true. Right? So the next time that you're stressed, to start to get the understanding that it's not the outside events that's stressing me out. It's the thoughts that I have it have about it that are stressing me out. And when I hold a thought to be true that isn't actually true for me, the outcome is stress. Stress is just my wiser mind saying, there's a problem here in your thinking, mm -hmm. right? From there, we can then use that stressful thought, bringing it into inquiry to allow us to see beyond it and to improve our wisdom, improve our compassion, and bring us back kind of home to ourselves, right? We, our birthright is to be kind and loving and wise and funny. You know, all of those tremendous qualities of children, that's who we really are. We fall out of that when we start to believe this anxious, provoking mind. And practices such as mindfulness, or inquiry, or even some of the practices you might do, your yoga, your music, your cooking, are really ways to get the wisdom of getting out of that very tight, constricted appliance we call this mind. And in particular, what I'd like you to think is don't believe anything you think. It's all, it's all made up junk, right? So Look into inquiry-based stress reduction if it speaks to you. And if it doesn't, look into the other things that do speak to you, right? It's, we're only here once. We can make our experience here so much better if we start to understand a little bit how our minds work and practice the things that allow us to see beyond it. Lara, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.